as we do share these out. Um, yeah, so um, welcome everybody to our latest webinar, the December installment of the Iowa OER webinar series. We hold these semi-regular information sessions for people who are working on all types of OER projects, both in the state of Iowa and outside. And this will be our last webinar of 2022. Um, hopefully we'll have, we'll pick them up again in the new year, most likely not till February or early March. Um, as always, if you have topics that are of interest to you, you can always feel free to send them to the Iowa OER Action Team through our website or through our Google group listserv. And I'll post all of that information in the chat in just a few minutes. Um, my name is Mariah Burnett, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Iowa, and I'm joined today by Dr. Delmar Larson from UC Davis, who is a chemistry professor and the Libra Texts founder. For those of you who are new to the platform or, you know, aren't familiar with it yet, Libra Texts is an easy-to-use platform for the construction, customization, and dissemination of open educational resources to reduce the burdens of unreasonable textbook costs to students in society. So Dr. Larson will be providing sort of an overview of the Libraverse today, um, including a demonstration of how to create customized OER in a variety of disciplines using the LibreTexts modular remixing system. And he'll also introduce ADAPT, which is a multifaceted online assessment infrastructure to accompany LibreText books and to provide a wide range of questioning options. So I'd like to keep the microphones muted until the end of the presentation, but if you do have questions, you can always drop them in the chat and um, we can address them after um, Delmar's demonstration. And um, again, the whole session is being recorded for posterity. If you want to share the recording with anybody or, or view it again after the session, you can always go to Iowa OER's um, YouTube channel. So I will now mute my mic and hand it over to Delmar Larson. Great. Thank you, Mariah. I'm going to share the screen which I do have permission to do and I'm going to start from here I feel like I'm starting a class right now okay that appears to work um so as Mariah was mentioning I'm going to be discussing the Libreverse uh I wasn't intending on or doing a hands-on based approach which I think Mariah mentioned here but if we have time afterwards I have no problem going into any of the details including being able to remix and use some of the other technologies that we have available so let's get this thing going so who am I uh, I'm a professor of chemistry at University of California Davis I've been there since 2005 I've been to a wide variety of different campuses before then as standard for academia. Uh, my research focuses on ultrafast laser spectroscopy as a photoactive biological systems. Uh, I have a big research lab, lasers that shoot things into proteins and they do a variety of stuff. Well, uh, over the last multiple decades, I've published about 100 peer review uh, publications. Um, things have slowed down a little bit since uh, the Libra texts and open has sort of taken on uh, a bigger role in my life. I'm the founder and director of the Libra text project, which was established in 2008. So that means we're about to celebrate our 15th year birthday. In fact, at the end of winter, we will be doing so, which means that in the grand scope of at least current OER infrastructures out there, we're fairly mature. Um, or at least old. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the UC Davis Aggie Open, which is an OER um, program on campus for general advocacy that's expected for uh, OER programs. Uh, I'm an adopter of OER, I'm an adapter of OER, I'm a creator of OER, and I'm a uh, curator of OER. And it's important in order to emphasize all these things here because it means that I wear multiple hats. In fact, very few people wear so many different hats in the community. So when people ask me questions, sometimes I'll bounce from one hat to another hat in order to be able to address it. The second thing that's actually important here is everything that we're doing in building and implementing the LibreTex project is a very practitioner-based approach uh, because we use what we make in the classroom. So we're not giving very philosophical, large, uh, sometimes impractical uh, applications of OER. We're actually uh, down there in the trenches uh, in using them off of there. So <clears throat> to the LibreTex project, as with most LibreTex, sorry, as most mission statements, uh, we had a bunch of people get together in order to really hone through a mission statement. Um, and after several weeks, they got something nice and beautiful and I decided I don't use it. So this is the one that I used uh, out there. So we're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption and adaption of OER that can be comprehensive and curated at multiple levels. And each of these three words here that are bolded are particularly important in order to define who we are and our goals. And each of these, 
unemphasized uh, words, construction, curation, adoption, action, uh, adaption, is exceedingly important in order to find the activities in which we actually implement that. Because we're uh, first and foremost an academic uh, institution. Like I said, we're faculty driven, practitioner driven, but we're particularly interested in, in moving beyond what a traditional publisher is able to provide. Uh, that is, publishing is not the final act in the the uh, the play here. It's actually just the end of the first act. Final. It, it, you have plenty more in order to be able to address. So anyways, let's define this community means that we're not making a one uh, size fits all approach. We're providing a mechanism for individuals to uh, exercise their agency, whether they're faculty, student, external experts, in order to be able to contribute uh, toward the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do, which is to uh, generate affordable education for students. Uh, <clears throat> uh, OER, we can spend a half a day plus defining what OER is, and of course, we don't have the time to do that. So for the sake of this conversation, I'm just going to say it's free. Um, I know it's more subtle than that, um, but the, that's not the point of what we're discussing. Comprehensive. So the LibreText project was born out of a precursor project called the ChemWiki. The ChemWiki uh, was an open pedagogy tool. I didn't know what that what that term was. Also, I didn't know what OER was for the first five years or so of the existence of the project. But the intent of it is I had lots of students that were going through my classes. Um, sometimes I would teach 500 student classes, and, and that provided a great opportunity for students to get engaged for a pedagogical reason, but also for generating what's now referred to as non-disposable assignments, aka building the textbook while we were moving forward. So chemistry uh, of the scope of the Libre text is still a significant part of what we, we are doing uh, and impact. So we follow now a no gap left behind policy, which means that uh, any academic field out there, we have a great interest in order to be able to uh, implement into the Libreverse. Um, and that's a horizontal expansion. There's also a vertical expansion. We do, carry K, uh, we do care about K-12. We care about graduate work and everything in between. So we follow no gap left behind policy. We also follow no tech left behind policy. So as emerging technologies become available, we go through efforts in order to integrate it into our infrastructure so that everyone can benefit from that technology without having to learn about how to implement them appropriately in whatever technologies that you may be using outside of the Libre text. And lastly, it could be curated. And um, this is exceedingly important uh, depending upon the population. But we don't believe that publishing is the last step. In fact, that's, like I said, one, the end of the first step. We need to constantly update, and we take it upon ourselves in order to maintain curation boards in order to be able to augment and constantly update our content, whether it's for accuracy or it's for introducing appropriate inclusiveness, or so it's just basically necessary in order to customize the content. So you need things to be dynamic. A dynamic living library would be something that you can come in and edit as you need or curate or customize as you need. The opposite of that would be a dead library. That would be something like a Google um, Drive full of PDFs. And it's not really well suited for being able to be optimized. Uh, and sometimes there's a little bit of things that I refer to as zombie libraries, which are more like referatories. They're not really repositories. They're, they're kind of subject to uh, external aspects of that. Anyways, um, so several definitions of note. I'm only throwing these uh, some words around here, and I want to make sure at least define them up here. So the Libretex is the term that we use that's the brand name of the entire effort, uh, of the project, the team, the company um, that, uh, that, that, we, that we have. LibreText exists both in academia and also as a not-for-profit entity outside of academia to allow us freedom that uh, working within my campus um, doesn't uh, allow. Libreverse is the, uh, the manifestation of our effort. It's basically this ecosystem of interconnected technologies to promote openness for learning, again, to pursue affordable education or free education as much as we can. Uh, and the LibreNet uh, is a consortium uh, that consists of campuses, systems, states that can join in order to utilize the Libreverse to the maximum capabilities uh, that's out there. We use the term Libre across probably too much uh, in various components of the Libreverse. So sometimes you'll hear me refer to it uh, to designate specific technologies that are more unique to our infrastructure, but the other people can actually utilize if they want. Like, for example, our Libra Commons uh, is part of our campus commons and conductor system, which I'll talk about in a moment. Libra Studios, our H5P repository, essential infrastructure that uh, we feel is more powerful than having things compartmentalized in individual books, uh, but people can actually set up in their own campus studio, et cetera. Um, 
So this is unfortunately not the most up-to-date version. If anyone in the OER universe hasn't heard of LibreText, I'm not doing my job very well. The LibreText project is the most popular based on traffic online activity for textbooks out there. We will be delivering or we will have delivered 1 billion page views by the end of winter quarter, which is a lot. Uh, so right now we're somewhere delivering about 850 to 900,000 page views per day. Uh, uh, we have about a half a million pages of OER content. Some of them are duplicates of each other. Um, we have uh, somewhere on the order of 130,000 uh, assessments that are part of the ADAPT homework system that I'll be talking about later on in this discussion. We have about two and a half thousand books, uh, some customized for individual campuses, some are curated by Central Things. Uh, and These are not really the best numbers. I, like I said, we're we're about 7 million millennia. So a uh, confirmed reading um, by students. So uh, if you haven't heard of the LibreText project, I'm not doing my job. Any chemist or any student who's taking chemistry uh, can't help but Google it. When they Google it, that LibreText is in the top uh, few entries of search, and it's like that across the board. So, so what is the Libreverse? Uh, so the Libreverse has three facets that are important in order to define what it is. One is as a construction platform for OER. And I use the term OER to be not just textbooks, but a broad range of different capabilities. It's a dissemination platform. In fact, it's the biggest uh, dissemination platform out there. When something is put into the Libreverse, uh, it gets distributed across the globe uh, using the traffic that I showed before. And it's also meant as a learning platform because again, we're in academia and we have an interest in order to be able to identify if the resources we're creating are actually useful. And the only thing that actually evaluates if something is useful is in order to evaluate the learning in the classroom. Um, so we have learning analytics in order to guide that. But because we are faculty, we're practitioners, we know the book or publishing the book is not the end game of what we're trying to do. So this is the Libreverse, uh, and I'll go to this, this uh, scheme uh, several times uh, during this presentation. It consists of multiple interconnected, pseudo-independently operating technologies. Uh, now, a key component of understanding how we operate is that we're not tied to a specific technology, which means that we don't take a single technology and try to push it beyond what that technology is capable of doing. That also provides us the flexibility and either build new technology to do what we want or adopt typically open source technology in order to be able to do that if we don't want to be able to build that. So the core component of the Libreverse are our libraries, and then we have these, and those are these 15 interconnected independently or pseudo independently operating wikis. Uh, we chose a wiki technology because it was the best for technology for large-scale collaborative construction efforts. Going back to that community component that I mentioned before, that's what I believe 15 years ago, and that's what I know right now, that that's the best technology out there. Uh, but we have a, a handful of other technologies in order to augment uh, those things. The key point is while these things are interconnected, we provide an opportunity in order for them to be a strong synergy in terms of what they uh, provide uh, faculty or students or uh, um, campuses in order to be able to pursue the goals that we want. So let's talk about the Libreverse, uh, sorry, the, uh, the the libraries, which is what most people uh, are familiar with uh, in the Libre text. So before we do that, I want to mention a little bit about some of the philosophies of how we actually have been pursuing this over the last handful of years. And the key point is that the OER universe is fragmented. It's been fragmented for a long time, and it's getting horrifically more fragmented. Um, and in some cases, it's getting consolidated. You could find content in the Open Textbook Library. Actually, specifically, you can find links to content in the Open Textbook Library. So it's probably more of a library guide than a library. You could find predominantly links, although you can find content stored in OER Commons. OpenStax has this range of content. Merlot has is referred to in repository capabilities. Open Sunny, Galileo, Open Oregon, Nova, BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, Alberta, um, uh, Hawaii, uh, Sailor, California State University. Uh, Oregon State University, and I could keep on going for a long, long time. So as many people who are involved in OER, and especially people who are uh, pushing OER on campuses for advocacy understands, finding OER can be really quite a mess. In fact, there's a great deal of content that is stored on various faculties, computers across the globe that would constitute OER. And because they are not easily found, they essentially makes it difficult in order to be able to address them. This fragmentation also is a serious impediment in terms of moving things forward because it doesn't capitalize on what other people have done. So the underlying philosophy of OER as 
everybody probably knows here is the sharing is caring model. When someone moves something or advances something on one campus, someone can capitalize on it and move it forward. But if you don't know what the other person has done, then you oftentimes replicate the wheel. And there's lots of replication of wheel, replication of effort. And I feel like that's a serious detriment to OER. And I felt that what, what it was 15 years ago, and I still believe that it's the case today, especially as states have started to scale up and provide investments in OER programs on campuses. So what we've done is we go through a process that we call harvesting, which is essentially ingesting or bringing in existing OER, capitalizing on the O in OER into our infrastructure. We then standardize the content, we centralize the content, uh, we make them interconverted collections, flexible and curatable. Essentially, we're building a bigger box of Legos. So if someone wants to be able to rapidly build a book, they can come in and build it and they have all the tools where the bigger that box of Legos is, the more powerful uh, the, the final product is, the easier it is in order to be able to build that. Um, and we're providing that for um, for the community. Anyone who's ever tried to cut and paste from PDF, try to paste into a Word document and had to do with all those sort of formatting issues, that's what my harvesters, because I have a team of students that are pursued, pursuing this. So we build this big box of Legos that are standardized, and again, standardized uh, subject to standards that we've established uh, within uh, our system. Now, fine. We have a hundred. We have a half a million pages of OER content. Uh, we need to have a mechanism in order to facilitate that. We didn't want them to be dispersed in a variety of different spots and difficult in order to, be able to bring together. So we built about four years ago uh, what we refer to as the OER Remixer, which is Remixer, which gives us a uh, a drag and drop based approach in order to be able to go through the corpus that we have again of a half a million pages of OER content and growing quite rapidly as we either build stuff or we uh, harvest content and let faculty drag and drop and build their book uh, really quickly off of here. Um, this uh, has been exceedingly powerful. It's the go-to approach in order to organize uh, and build OER. And we're very proud of what the capabilities are. And we're gonna be releasing a new version of it uh, later on next year. So if you go to any of our libraries, you'll see, you'll see that it's organized in three different steps, three different areas. One would be the central bookshelves, or just bookshelves. Those are the uh, books, the collections that the LibreText development team curates. We maintain, we update. Now we curate everything, but we prefer to focus predominantly on the central bookshelves. And we let the content that's stored in the campus bookshelves, which is what individual faculty and individual campuses can actually build their own campus bookshelf there in order to be able to cultivate and build their own books off of there. We try not to get involved in curation of that stuff with the exception of issues like um, accessibility and accuracy and things like that, because we want to try to maintain a level of quality uh, across the board. We also have uh, content stored in learning objects. Those are things that are not e easily well suited uh, for textbook collections, for example, repository of workshop worksheets or uh, visual objects or simulation, things like that. Again, the point is that each page that we have on our infrastructure is a Lego piece of quantum that can be combined together. And when it gets big enough, you're essentially not limited. You're only limited by your imagination. And that's what I really would love uh, to be able to uh, to get to. But we have a lot of gaps in order to, uh, to address, as many people uh, no doubt recognize. I will mention uh, that for the longest time, we had a more wiki-based uh, view off of here. We just released a reader view, which is something that looks closer to what students would want to look at without having to deal with editing efforts and other things like that. That's available on all our books. Uh, you can see it in the upper right-hand corner of any page, um, and uh, it provides a nicer uh, experience for that. We have a variety of mechanisms to disseminate, not just basically dominating the distribution of OER on the internet. Uh, we can generate PDFs. We can embed into learning management systems. We can uh, provide print files if you want to be able to go to Amazon or you want to go to uh, Lulu Express or any other print-on-demand infrastructure. We do have a bookstore that takes any book that's been created and provides a mechanism to hand it off to the publisher um, <clears throat> at cost or nearly at cost. Uh, uh, so you can get, for example, my chemistry book that I teach in my general chemistry class is about was about twelve dollars before the pandemic. Now it's like fifteen to sixteen dollars out there. Uh, we will have EPUB generation very soon. Um, we had something and then we modified it. We're going to take it uh, off of there. 
uh, pull it back, that is. Uh, we have the ability to embed our content in Raspberry Pi boxes, which gives us the ability in order to distribute these things to developing countries, or as what was discovered during the pandemic, uh, many populations uh, in America don't have access to high-speed internet, either due to infrastructure not being there, or just not due to, or due to the absence of um, financial capabilities to tap into that. I, um, so, um, so that's the, the libraries. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at them uh, as you desire. <clears throat> so one of the key aspects that really uh, sets us aside from other platforms that are out there is that we actually uh, care about the curation of the content. It's the, the publishing doesn't stop at publishing. Uh, uh, I'm sure the publishing stops, but you want to be able to continually update and that. So we have a series of servers in order to facilitate uh, that uh, infrastructure, which gives us the ability in order to lar do large scale curation efforts, large scale global changes in order to be able to address a wide range of different uh, things. And I mentioned uh, already the importance of having curation capabilities in order to address uh, accessibility, uh, changing accessibility requirements, in order to address uh, DEI-based issues, which is bots don't typically address that, or just accuracy or other issues necessary in order to be able to do it. So we want to ha we have this massive set of tools in order to facilitate large-scale curation efforts. Um, <clears throat> Along the same lines of accessibility, because that's part of our curation efforts, uh, we go through a lot of effort in order to try to address a general accessibility for text, organizations, video, homework, uh, interactive elements, and a wide range of other things. What, uh, I'm sorry, wrong arrow. Why is this not working? Sorry, something's missing here. Okay, uh, so the uh, <clears throat> to address that, we we have some bots dedicated for accessibility uh, in order to do wide uh, fix a wide range of issues that people have when they start to edit. Here, we also have built into our editor an accessibility checker, which lets authors do real time checking of at least eight to nine of the important components associated that typically are um, fail to be addressed for accessibility purposes, and that's going to be growing in power. The, my primary a mode of operation is it's important in order to teach authors about accessibility, but I prefer them to spend as much of their time focusing on subject matter expertise matters rather than focusing on the accessibility and let the technology in order to do that or have a secondary team in order to handle accessibility that's out there. So uh, I'll mention this briefly. Uh, I am a physical scientist. Uh, I teach upper divisional classes. I teach graduate classes. Uh, it's important for me to introduce what I refer to as the textbook of the future. The textbook of the future is not just basically text or video, sorry, text or images. It's introducing interactive capabilities in order to improve engagement that then improves education. For the sciences, one of the key components that I want uh, from a from the very beginning of my project, but only been able to implement in the last five years, is to have the ability to embed executable code. And that's useful because I want students by the time, and many people do, in order by the time that they graduate with a bachelor's degree to have some exposure with coding. That gives us the ability in order to do a lot of powerful things. For example, when I teach my uh, my quantum mechanics class, uh, I have students interact with this code, which is Python, that they, they can then uh, uh, manipulate, uh, edit as necessary in order to see the output. And from that, they're not just doing a widget-based approach in order to be able to see these things. They're learning about what they need to do for coding. And that's important for a wide range of things, including being able to build advanced questions within the ADAPT homework system for its uh, its advanced questioning capabilities. Uh, because it's community, that means we can capitalize on other people's activities. This was a, uh, a tweet uh, several years ago where someone made a Python code uh, that I particularly liked and I wanted to be able to grab, and I did, and, and introduce it into my general chemistry class using this infrastructure. Uh, so you can do a lot of very powerful things when you have a lot of very powerful tools behind it. Commons and Conductor. We released the Commons and Conductor uh, last year, but we haven't really done a lot of focus on uh, telling people about it. Uh, the Commons and Conductor is a secondary technology to our libraries, which is designed in order to handle two things. So the Commons, I know it has a very peculiar name, but the Commons is the front end. That's the one that's basically a catalog. So you can go and do a search through and find books with subject to specific uh, searching uh, infrastructures and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so the
there we go. Okay, so it's a front end catalog. Uh, campuses that are part of the LibreNet get their own branded version of that for their own uh, stakeholders, whether they're students, faculty, uh, and other uh, stakeholders. You can have uh, build collections. This is useful um, for uh, systems that want to be able to identify uh, books for specific campuses on their systems. It provides a mechanism to showcase the homework, the libraries. You can go in and identify what other uh, projects that are under development and that goes into the conductor and I mentioned there are two flavors one's the Libra Commons which you can find at, at commons.libratex.org and then we have a range of campus commons that everyone gets if they're part of the LibreNet. Uh, the conductor it is the back end that's a lot more sophisticated than the front end and this is a project management tool uh, and we coordinate hundreds and hundreds of projects, whether they're internal or they're external to our development team. Uh, and this was a mechanism in order to facilitate it because my inbox just couldn't handle that. Uh, so this is a project management team, project management uh, infrastructure that you can go into a project, you can uh, assign teams, you can go through a wide range of different uh, capabilities, you can set alerts. So if you sign up for an account for that, which is free for the community, although this is optimized for LibreText, you can come in and say, I want to get a notification when a chemistry book uh, has been released uh, into the infrastructure uh, uh, or any other type of field, which is particularly convenient for uh, many many people in the community. It, this is where you go through harvesting requests. So if you have an OER con OER that you want to be able to put into our infrastructure, it goes through this. This is how we facilitate adoptions, peer reviews, communications, both intra-team and inter-team communications. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you can also look at uh, other developments, other projects and other um, campuses of the LibreNet. And the, again, the point is, if you're going to be building a project, it's convenient to know if anyone else is building a project within our infrastructure so that you don't recreate the wheel and also facilitates, again, this community uh, uh, instance off of here. The, I will mention one of the more powerful things that's not uh, written down here is the ability in order to keep a, a very detailed accessibility overview of a book, uh, basically a, an accessibility compliance review matrix that's sort of mini connected to the book, which is very detailed. In fact, the most most detailed out there in the uh, the infrastructure in the OER infrastructure outside of commercial uh, reviews that are there. This is what the front end looks like. At least it did a handful of months ago, uh, which randomly picked a, a set of books that were out there. Actually, this is Prince George Community College. I'm sorry, uh, uh, their instance. This is the back end. This is just the top part of a project in order uh, to give some information regarding how to build these things. I will mention. We tried about five different types of technologies, Trello-based approaches, the Kanban-based approaches, uh, and a handful of other ones, and we just couldn't find anything that we felt was reasonable. This is open source. Anyone can grab it and run their own, or you can get free access to it, again, by going to commas.libretext.org, and you get an account and just run with it there. I mentioned we're in academia and we have a particular interest in order to make sure that what we're creating is actually useful. And the only real metric in order to determine if something is useful in academia is, is it uh, are students learning from the resource? More specifically, are they learning what you want uh, them to, to do in the resource? And 99.9% .9 of all books, whether they're OER or commercial, don't have that metric, that level of efficacy established off of there. We just released um, our learning analytics dashboard. So anyone who creates a book uh, on our, uh, our uh, platform has the ability in order to run learning analytics tools in order to be able to get access to at least version 1.0, relatively simple, but useful, actionable data in order to guide the development of the pedagogy or uh, evaluate the efficacy of the resource that they're doing. This is a res this is something that I, I published several, actually a long time ago, uh, which showed uh, activity in a class where they were using the then Kim Wiki, the precursor to the LibreText as the sole textbook of the class. And you can see that the activity the students read before exams was great. And I, uh, I was able to determine the uh, detriment of cramming, or at least the correlation of cramming to poor performance, which is about 10% uh, lower for the students that crammed. And I, the next quarter, uh, during winter quarter, decided to try to change my pedagogy up in order to be able to uh, reduce the magnitude of the peak of this to the background off of here. That's just one example that's uh, connected to that. This is an example of the learning analytics. This is looking at the activity of the book. Uh, uh, 
average for the class uh, per day versus, in this case here, a specific page of the book, but we can identify a specific student that's coming there. Everything is subject to appropriate for FERPA protections and such if anyone has an interest to that. Um, and the learning analytics also collects data from how students interact with the homework system, which I'll be getting to in a moment. Uh, so you have two streams of data in order to uh, evaluate how students are working with that. Coupling that in version 2.0 will be a learning and um, learning objects and learning outcome infrastructure so you can identify completion or compliance with uh, appropriate learning objectives in the class, you know, which is good for auditing purposes. Forms this is relatively straightforward. We have a range of different communication uh, mechanisms. We have forums. We have a chat room. We're going to be expanding the Commons and Conductor in order to take those leads in addition to using the Commons and Conductor in order to build communities of practice um, out there, which is already what it's designed for doing, but we're going to be augmenting that uh, in the near future. Project Solo. Uh, Project Solo, uh, we haven't mentioned much about. The intent of Project Solo is that you can have a standalone technology that you can implement, open source, implement on your own server um, in order to host the, uh, host the books, but it also has H5P capabilities has assessments, has an, uh, uh, analyzed. It's sort of like how Pressbooks that you can actually run it on individual servers, but it has a much more powerful infrastructure. It's not a blogging software, which is where Pressbooks came from. It is a, a Drupal-based technology, which is intrinsically a more powerful approach for doing things. And that gives us the ability in order to distribute content to campuses that don't want to necessarily take advantage of the central core uh, Libreverse. Um, and we're very excited about this as a mechanism for uh, distribution uh, and also for many campuses that don't have enough money, especially K-12, some K-12 campuses in the country uh, that don't have enough money for running their own um, learning management system. And this is sort of a learning management system light that carries a lot of the capabilities they have and they can have it for free. Um, they be underlying the the solo is the solo net uh, and the solo net gives the ability in order to have uh, uh, the the benefits of a centralized uh, network for sharing a content but allow peer-to-peer -peer review off of there so this is something akin to uh, uh, moodle net but it has a little bit more uh, curation control if it actually goes to the central infrastructure because again we're in academia uh, and we are concerned about the content that's out there and we're subject matter experts at least in our own specific fields in order to be able to do that the curation board is particularly important to that Okay, so in the last 10 minutes of this presentation, I want to talk about uh, the ADAPT homework system. So we knew that we wanted to build a homework system for uh, what we were building along for the infrastructure that we were building a long, long time ago. Uh, but every partnership that we established in order to be able to uh, advance this approach failed largely due to mission mismatch. Because again, we try to operate at the lowest level possible. So if you took a look at this, we're a not-for-profit entity. We're trying to find out what is the lowest amount of money that we can uh, we need in order to sustain and distribute our stuff out. This is the opposite of for-profit companies that are trying to find what is the maximum amount of money that they can request people to pay for uh, before it starts to break down off it. So we have a very different uh, approach for doing these sort of things, whether it happens to be in the OER platform infrastructure or in this case in homework. And people started looking at all the students, people meaning uh, people uh teams that have built technologies around uh homework looked at the number of students we had multiplied times a number and saw massive dollar signs and that was a very different uh, issue with us so we had a mission mismatch so several years ago actually four years ago we got some money from the u.s department of education uh, that provided us opportunity in order to start uh, pursuing that. And then two years ago, the state of California invested a million dollars into building ADAPT, which is our homework system and open source infrastructure in order to advance what we want to do. Um, I haven't, we haven't formally announced it, but the state of California also put in their budget $4 million in order to advance ADAPT. So if you haven't heard about ADAPT, you're going to hear a lot more about ADAPT in the near future because we have the money and the talent in order to be able to advance us to where we want to go. So back to building the, the system. So the, the question I would ask you is, how do you build an online homework system that complements the utility of the Libre text infrastructure I just discussed? And it's flexible, dynamic, comprehensive, integrated, LMS agnostic, which is important, exceedingly important uh, out there, and powerful, uh, um, and nearly free, uh, or free if we can go about doing that. Uh, and the answer to that is very slowly. Said so we started... Uh, pursuing this thing many years ago. In fact, the first effort we started pursuing is when we downloaded back in 2009, a Moodle instance 
to handle homework system. And then we decided that that was just not going to do it for us. So we started to advance other things. So the key point uh, along with the rest of OER is to not reinvent the wheel, not if we don't have to. So the idea behind it, I'm going to give a little bit of philosophy behind this, and I can actually go to this if people desire and see various things on the exact homework system, uh, is to capitalize on existing infrastructures. Let's see here, this is not showing animations didn't work very well there, um, is to capitalize on what other people have done. Again, the sharing is caring model off of there. So there are lots of online homework systems. Many of them, most of them are probably commercial, uh, or at least not open source. <laughs> the more successful commercial ones are either the ones that are coupled into learning management systems. Uh, and I know some learning management systems are, are open source, but not necessarily independent of all the rest of the stuff that's connected to LMSs. Uh, web work is one of the first successful large scale homework systems out there. Lon Kappa would probably be uh, predate this a little bit if, if anyone knows about that. That came from the University of Rochester. Uh, that's a server side evaluation as well. Uh, it's very powerful, but in order to be able to do that product productively, use it productively, let me phrase that, to create problems productively, you need to learn Perl. So structured programming language or at least a subset of Perl. IMath A is the technology that underlies MyOpenMath, uh, which is the same technology underlying Lumen Ohm. So they didn't actually create it. They 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 grabbed this free technology. Um, and there are a handful of other ones that are out there. Um, that is exceedingly powerful, just like web work. It requires a different language to write, PHP instead of uh, instead of Perl, um, uh, and it's server-side evaluation. When I say server-side, it means it, that the evaluation is done on my server or on the LibreText server, not on the computer that's actually looking at that. H5P, as many of you have probably been exposed to, uh, has advanced a lot over the last few years, largely because you can create problems without having to learn about making these programs. I should be clear here, all of these things are such that the you write a program in order to do the problem. It's just that whether in H5P and, and also learning management systems, that's typically a graphical writing uh, and uh, web work in IMath AS is more traditional typing and coding and things like that. H5P is exceedingly powerful, flexible. It has lots of issues dealing with accessibility uh, and it's client side evaluation, which means it's easy to hack into. If you wanna know how to hack into it, a student can pull up an H5P example, a problem on any system, Unplug the internet, get the answer, uh, plug the internet back in and submit it. So in other words, H5P should be used very carefully, uh, uh, but it's exceedingly powerful uh, mechanism for, um, for augmenting, especially bringing in a lot of graphical capabilities uh, uh, to complement these other ones. And QTI stands for question and test interoperability. Unfortunately, it's anything about interoperable. It's actually really quite a pain in the butt. Uh, <clears throat> but that's the protocol that's used in learning management systems. All four of these technologies we have with an ADAPT. And the intent of here is not to choose a single technology that can be used across multiple fields, but let faculty come in and capitalize on the existing infrastructure that's created in these, field, in these technologies and to use the technology that, cut, that best suits their needs or their student needs out there. We have other technologies that are being addressed. I mentioned this investment of funds from the state of California. We're gonna be advancing organic chemistry uh, this winter, uh, which will be really great for the chemists in the audience, uh, including myself. Um, we have spreadsheet capabilities for, um, for statistics and for um, accounting. Uh, we have a, I mentioned the Jupyter Notebook system that has a homework system which gives the ability for people to write code, especially in computer science uh, classes, and that could be integrated into a thing. I'll mention clickers uh, momentarily. So this is a really bestial approach of doing things, uh, but it provides the opportunity to address all those issues I talked about before. So underlying, I should mention here, each one of these things uh, operates as a microservice. So we have a server dealing with web work, a server dealing with IMAF AS, a, ser a, a server dealing with H5P. The QTI is integrated natively into the ADAPT uh, infrastructure behind it. So while this is all open source, this is not just something you download and you run. You actually have, have to spend a lot of effort in order to put everything together and make it work. The Libra Studio is our free H5P repository. We have somewhere in the order of 10,000 H5P questions off of there. We need to have control over this because we want to be able to, to let people build questions and then be able to take those questions and either embed them into books or embed them into ADAPT. And then ADAPT can be embedded into, um, or books can, or ADAPT can be embedded into learning management systems. Uh, I encourage anyone to take a look at the studio. Um, it's one of the larger repositories of H5P out there. And, 
uh, and we've been providing a lot of value added components to organizing and uh, distributing them that you don't get in other uh, infrastructures. Uh, <clears throat> this is what uh, ADAPT looks like uh, right now. Uh, the interface that shows a series of classes. I've used these. Uh, I've been using this extensively for the last two years, um, and it's been quite productive for me, especially as things advanced. Um, Let's just talk about a few features uh, of ADAPT. So uh, like a the key point here is that we recognize that no single technology can handle all the use cases. And we want to be able to build a technology that's not just focused on chemistry or not just focused on physics. We want something very powerful across the board. In fact, while chemistry is the first or the most popular field for using ADAPT, the second most popular field is Spanish as a second language. So the idea behind here, and at this point, I will ask you guys to to at least internalize, hopefully internalize this key component. You can't have flexibility and power without complexity. My job is to try to make the complexity as hidden as possible, but the reality is if you want me, want something super powerful, you, you have some level of complexity, and that's what we're, that's what I'm going through, the power of that, well, the flexibility of this. So questions can either be auto-graded or open-ended graded. When I teach my upper divisional classes, there are many questions that uh, students will have to take that are not suited for auto graded. Um, and I'm fortunate that I, being an R1 institution, have a lot of TAs in order to be able to do a lot of the human grading. I know many campuses that don't have quite that luxury. Um, Open-ended grading, students can submit text or plain text. They can submit audio, which again is useful for uh, second languages, or files, PDF, Excels, and a handful of other things. Auto grade uses those four technologies I mentioned before. Uh, uh, and uh, such. So you can use it in various ways. Uh, I'm going to mention this quite quickly. If you go to any homework system, there's typically a set of services connected to the utility of that system. Uh, one is a problem builder, a problem library, a problem searcher, assessment delivery, assessment checker, grade book, and interface. It takes a lot of effort typically for someone to learn and master that for the specific class. But then if they do that for web work, mastering it for IMath AS or MyOpenMath or any sort of QTI based approach or uh, as QTI or H5P or any of the other technologies that we're advancing is a daunting task for a faculty member. So in other words, faculties typically stop at one level. What we are doing with ADAPT is to take these things and essentially uh, gut them so they have a centralized problem library, a centralized search infrastructure, gradebook, and LMS, so that you can use any of these questions as a faculty member for your classes without having to worry about the details about how they actually operate. And, and that means that as the library gets bigger and bigger, it becomes better and more powerful for people to operate especially after you start introducing algorithmic capabilities and other more advanced um, approaches for delivering these things. So there are different approaches in which people, uh, students can interface to ADAPT. One is via the direct uh, ADAPT uh, website, which is adapt.libretext.org. Uh, you can embed questions into your textbook and then your textbook becomes a homework system. That's what um, uh, faculty at Kansas State University have been doing. That book could be embedded into your learning management system if you feel that that's the right way in order to go about doing that. Um, uh, we will be releasing soon uh, the phone app, which will be a both I, uh, um, iPhone and Android-based system, which provides the opportunity of using ADAPT as in-class personal response systems, clickers, polls um, uh, out there. So if, you, if your students pay for that, you then don't have to worry about that. And that's useful for also H5P because H5P uh, is hard to hack, slow to hack into uh, effectively on here. So you can use that technology here well. Well, anyways, um, uh, uh, you can embed these things uh, uh, directly into your learning management system. Uh, you can pass grades back via LTI if you have everything set up right. If you don't, you could do uh, just simple CSV um, uh, pass about, which works uh, quite nicely. I'm very excited about the phone apps because I know very little about phone apps. Um, so it's a new uh, new playing toy for me. But again, this is going to be uh, an exceedingly powerful approach in order to not just do in-class polling, but also gives you the ability in order to tap into the phone, uh, sorry, the uh, camera of the phone. So you can actually have people get together in work groups and then submit their scores just with a simple uh, press of the button with their phone. Uh, and that provides a mechanism to do other things. For example, some faculty have been expressing concerns about trying to get around the Chegg Course Hero uh, integrity issue by actually having people not just submit the answer, but also submit their work really quickly with just a, a simple snapshot and then make it work in order to show that people are actually going through the work. It doesn't work perfectly, 
to address that issue, but it goes a, a long way. So I'm almost over. I'm, I'm almost done with this. Um, Adapt is designed for multi uh, multimodal use. You can deliver questions to students where uh, a assignment is open at a specific date and time and a specific date and time, uh, and it's a more traditional way of doing things. Um, you can, uh, where the students, when they get their assignment, they have multiple questions and they just go question by question assignment. ADAPT is called ADAPT because the California Education Learning Lab that funds a project wanted us to build a system that has adaptive learning capabilities. And I have a strong issue with black box adaptive learning capabilities because they spoon feed answers or questions to students, not answers, uh, and they don't really know why they're doing it. And they're not entirely clear what, what's up. I want to build an infrastructure that helps to build metacognition and self-efficacy agency uh, by the students. So learning trees are our approach for doing it where instead of a single question, you have a question at the top of the tree, the student gets it wrong, they can go into the tree in order to learn subcomponents necessary in order to be able to advance it. So you can think of it as a virtual tutor, although that term has been used in a variety of different cases already, but the idea is to provide remediation to students. But we do it right now as a choose your own adventure story. We let the students decide where they want to go, but they don't get a do-over of their question unless they satisfy at least one of the question uh, or the or the skill branch assessments here. So the idea is to provide an incentive for them to continue on um, uh, and go through the question over and over. Uh, there's a lot of issues behind that. And unfortunately I don't have the time in order to be able to address that. Um, uh, I mentioned the Libra Studio already. You can go to Libra, you can go to studio.libratex.org um, uh, and uh, access it. So I'll end with what I started, which is the mission uh, statement. We're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'm certainly uh, excited in order to address any questions that may pop up. All right, thank you so much for such an informative and information-filled presentation. We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first is um, from Caitlin. She says, is the student data from the learning analytics dashboard anonymized? No. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, actually it is. Uh, it depends on how you actually view it. Uh, so um, the, the analytics comes from a variety of different sources, like I mentioned, from how students interact with the textbook and how they interact with the, the homework system. Um, only instructors of record get access to those streams and they have to very carefully put them together. Uh, and uh, if the way that we actually set it up uh, in order to handle our issues with making sure things are as freely available as possible, but still wanna be able to track how individual students read the book, uh, we require students to sign in or authenticate with any Google or Microsoft enabled account. So that means that it's not just any student in your class, it's any student in the world can do so. Um, you have to submit a roster before you're able to see those students. Otherwise, everything is just uh, all anonymized. And just a whole bunch of numbers associated. So you're able to identify a student, but let me phrase it, you'll know a student, but you don't know who that student's connected to. Uh, that's that's out there. Um, that probably hopefully addresses your issue. If there are more specifics, I can talk about that. I will mention one of the cool things that we were doing, we have implemented to adapt. Um, and this is because I have TAs that are grading my classes. And I have TAs oftentimes, if you teach a big 500 student class, they will favor the students that are in their section over other students. So I have an anonymized uh, or bias button. So that students never see, TAs never see the names of the students that they are grading. And I've had people request that not just for the students, but for the instructors. So an instructor can completely do the whole grading of the class, uh, and they don't ever have to look to find out who a specific student's name is or, or any of the logistics associated or that come in with that, which I'm very excited to be able to address because then you could, you could argue that um, you don't have any bias connected to that. So did I answer your question, Caitlin, or is, or is there another component that you want to be able to address? Great. Um, like I said, the, uh, we have released the learning analytics dashboard. We've been dreaming of the learning analytics dashboard for years. Um, so now we're very excited about it. It's open source. You can find it in GitHub without, of course, student data <laughs> behind it. Um, <clears throat> and, but we're really excited in order to be able to start rel uh, scaling this out. So when you have a book on LibreText, you can then start to identify actionable information about how that book is used, 
if it's productive, um, and then uh, use that in order to guide your pedagogy um, uh, and the construction efforts off of there. And there are a handful of other things component with that. So. Great. We also had a question from Dan who said, why did you decide not to use Moodle? It wasn't very good. No. All right. I had a quick question. At so, least it wasn't very good then. Uh, yeah, I don't know about now. Yeah, I, I too have not looked at Moodle in a number of years. But, um, for those who are interested in kind of dipping their toes into LibreText, like maybe, you know, this is after watching this webinar, they want to kind of take a look at what's there or or start kind of playing around with um, with even adapting some some of the existing resources. Where would you recommend that they begin? Um. Well, I mean, it depends upon which feature <laughs> that you're referring to, because it's a very comprehensive, uh, hopefully it's clear to you guys, it's a very comprehensive big uh, infrastructure. So if you, if you want to build any, let me see, register, typing, um, <clears throat> I typed a link right there. Um, so one of the things that, we, one of the issues we've had with building this big infrastructure is that there's each camp, each technology has its own authentication authorization infrastructure. So you have lots of accounts. And accounts are getting really daunting for people. Um, we will be releasing in the next few weeks uh, our Libra One uh, single sign-on infrastructure. So you sign into one account, and then you have access to everything that you should have access to uh, across the board. So things are a little clunky right now in terms of having to balance various accounts that are out there. The exception to that is if you if you want to just couple into your campus um, credentials. So uh, if you go to register.libretext.org, uh, it will go to an entry on our, that's, what is that? Okay. Uh, it'll go to an entry to request instructor accounts for various things. Now, in order to be able to access this, you need to get an account on the Libre, on the Commons of Conductor. And like I said, that's freely available by just going to login conductor and you can register right here or you can couple into your campus. So if you want uh, to just get access to other, uh, to the, the rest of the infrastructure off of here, um, you can request this and it'll give you access to a library, get you access to um, any of the other components associated with, uh, with the system. And this is gonna be a little bit more uh, centralized. Um, we also have, it's important for us to verify instructor status, and especially for access to adapt homework system, because we have to maintain some level of integrity of the question. Uh, I know that's sort of the opposite of openness. We're trying to to do both, but in order to be practical, we need to be able to have some protection for students not to be able to have free running off of everything. Otherwise, every single question we have will have the solutions in Chegg and Coursera. Uh, so. Uh, that's where you start. Uh, if you want to learn more about these things, if you go to uh, libretext.org, I'm sorry, you, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, youtube.libretext.org, you'll find a range of different uh, uh, things. We we run a professional development series called Libretech, Librefest, and uh, you can find a range of videos off of here. If you want to learn more about ADAPT, uh, we have a... Um, an adapt dedicated web uh adapt dedicated um what i call mini fest um that will be virtual in two days and so i pasted it right there it's a nine to nine to three uh thing and it goes into finer details on how to build a course how to build assignments how to build questions how to use existing questions how to uh, build trees and how to go through uh, lots of these things more logistics than what the just a few minutes uh, can do uh, right here and i encourage you to uh, if you have time uh, to take a look at it. that will be um, filmed not filmed recorded and placed on uh, our youtube channel uh, next week if you're unable to attend so that may be more than what you asked about but yeah Awesome. Yeah, I would really recommend the trainings. I took one of the October, I think I, I took a Libra Fest training in October and it was super helpful um, yeah. and just it clarified a lot of things for me. Yeah, the October Libra Fest, uh, we have all the videos here. Um, if you want to go back to it, we we're very excited about that. It was a nice little sort of streamlined thing. Uh, normally our Libra Fest are three full day uh, virtual events. So the sort of thing that we need to take lots and lots of vitamins beforehand in order to be able to get through the uh, the, the thing. Very true. Dan also asks, will assessment on ADAPT run in other LMSs or are they embedded? Um, well, they're both. 
um, the, um, I mean, any external uh, system to an LMS will be embedded in, in, into the uh, LMS. But if you have LTI uh, passback, then uh, for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's an LMS. So if you have all the appropriate things, you can go about uh, uh, doing that. Um, we've only uh, built the LTI interface to um, Canvas and to Blackboard. Um, uh, we know there are other LMSs out there. We just haven't gotten around to building the LTI uh, interface. Um, we had some conversations with uh, Wisconsin's technical uh, system in order to do that because we were expanding, and this will be released soon, uh, expanding ADAPT for the new nursing uh, protocol. So we're building uh, with, again, the Wisconsin technical uh uh, system. Uh, I think it's 20 to 30 new uh, question types that are formally the national based approach. They're populating, they're giving them out there. So there are many companies that are setting these things up in order to sell them for tens of thousands of dollars access per campus. And you have that with Lieber with ADAPT directly. Thanks again to Wisconsin uh, underwriting that. So we'll, we may be doing D2L soon. Um, and and some of the other LMSs uh, when we get the time for doing so. All right, does anybody have any other questions? Well, I would like to just say thanks so much, Delmar, for agreeing to come and talk to, um, talk to us today. And I'm really excited to start recommending the ADAPT homework system in particular, I think to our faculty, because what we often hear in, in the course of OER conversations is that, well, I would love to adopt OER, but you know, I, I just can't give up that proprietary homework system that comes with Pearson or whatever. And so I think you know, something like ADAPT really goes a long way towards starting to meet those needs. And, and I'm personally really excited to see where it's headed next. Yeah, we're very excited about ADAPT. We knew we wanted to do it. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but the state of California liked what we did over the first two years um, and decided to, you know, scale us up fivefold uh, in order to be able to do it. So anyone who has, so the nice thing about this, you can bring in existing uh, question banks from other sources. So if you have something stored in your learning management system, you can embed them into ADAPT. You can then use those questions into any other mechanisms that we have, whether it's through the, um, the phone uh, interface for the clickers or through the uh, uh, through the learning trees or other uh, components that are not intrinsically uh, a feature as, of the learning management system. So we're going to be going through a lot of effort of harvesting existing content into our approach. We just have been slow about that, uh, and we're but it's going to be exceedingly powerful um, and uh, exceedingly cheap. Um, that's out there. So. Well, that's great. Something to look forward to. All right. Well, um, thank you again for joining us today. And um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your week. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.